I was once canoeing the boundary waters between Minnesota and Canada. These aren't your normal backyard ponds. The boundary waters are thousands of enormous lakes interconnected with each other. Think many great lakes. We'd been canoeing and camping along the lakes for about a week at this point. We didn't really have an itinerary, just planned a boat and camp, fish, and live off the land for two weeks. We had a GPS and sat phone to call a helicopter for pickup whenever we were done. Anyway, about a week in and we were set to canoe for a few hours to the next lake. An hour or so in, and we're in the center of an extremely long and narrow lake. Unfortunately, a storm started to blow in, and the waves on the lake swelled to two plus feet. Too much for our dinky canoes. We pull off to a random clearing on the shore, and set up camp in a rush to avoid being totally thrashed by a rainstorm. We just set up camp and hunkered down for the night. By the next morning, it had cleared up. We started walking up the coast of the lake, about 200 feet from our camp, looking for a good fishing spot. What we actually found was another campsite. However, it was absolutely wrecked. Trash strewn everywhere, tent collapsed and torn, clothes on the ground. At first, we were just like disgusted. What asshole did this or left their stuff out to be bear food? The more we looked around, though, the weirder things seemed. For one, their garbage was still hoisted into a tree to keep it safe from bears, but the whole bag was ripped open, despite it being 30 feet in the air. Second, literally everything except the canoes was still at the campsite. Clothes, packs, food, rope, pans, like a serious set of hiking equipment enough for two or three people. Half of it was trashed and torn open, mostly the packs, tent, and clothes. The other half was totally untouched, but thrown on the ground, like somebody noped the hell out of there in nothing but their long johns, ditching hundreds of dollars of gear in the process. We waited a couple of hours and eventually called it back to our helicopter crew, but they hadn't been aware of anybody else or gotten any distress calls. We eventually just left everything and moved camp. Everybody was pretty upset by it, and a day or two later, we ended the whole trip early because it seemed like nobody wanted to be out there anymore. It was the weirdest thing I'd ever seen. First thought was a bear attack, but there was food left uneaten, and I've seen bear attacks on camps before, but nothing like this. Bears rip open packs and go after food, and are generally pretty easy to scare away. What still sticks with me is why all their clothes and packs were still there, with half being totally destroyed and the other half being untouched. I still don't get it. I've done a lot of other camping and hiking, rafting and biking, all around the country, and I've never had any other weird experiences like that. I experienced my creepy middle-of-nowhere story while driving a bus in the desert of central Australia. I was over 500 kilometers from the nearest town, so yeah, Middle of nowhere stuff. I was out on a five day charter to pick up a bunch of Aboriginal elder women to go and get their women's business health checks done. On the day, we went via a place called Mintabi so they could shop in the clothing store and whatever store that's randomly in this little opal mining area of South Australia. We left from there quite late to make the three or so hour journey back to where we were all staying overnight. The next day, I take them back to their respective desert communities. The passengers all fell asleep as it had a very long day. Even the nurse who was traveling with us fell asleep. So there's me, all alone in the cab of the Mercedes truck derived bus. My 30 passengers all sleeping in the darkness of the passenger pod behind the cab. And it was around 9pm. 
Up ahead in the distance, I see a headlight coming towards me along the lonely desert dirt road. So I dip my lights so the spotlights go off and adjust to see only what low beam will show me. I drive down into a slight dip of a dry creek bed, expecting to see the car with only one headlight any time shortly. It's nothing unusual to see a car with only one headlight out there, so I'm not even remotely bothered. As I come out of the dip, I put my spotlights and high beams back on, and there is no car, no nothing, just the empty dirt road. There's no dust in the air, and I can see a good distance in front of me and out to each side. There was nothing there, just the empty desert, the dirt road and me alone in the cab. I keep the lights on until we come to a stop about an hour later. I didn't see any cars or anything the rest of the journey. Before I let the passengers out, I ask any of them if they saw the light, and they all go dead silent. And after a short while, they start talking in their own language hurriedly, and then they all get off the bus. A few minutes later, a couple of ladies come up to me and ask me to tell them exactly what I saw, without leaving anything out and to describe exactly where I saw it. Now, I'm a big guy. I lived on three continents. I've been a police officer, a teacher, bus and coach driver, truck driver, all sorts of things. Let's just say that I'm pretty skeptical, but I do have an open mind. I'm not scared by much in this world. After I told the ladies everything from start to finish, and describe in minute detail exactly where it happened, the two ladies looked at me with their eyes wide. They looked spooked, and they said, and I'll never forget the way they said it, Driver, we're so lucky that you did not stop, because if you did, no one would have ever seen us ever again. We'd all be gone. I asked why, and they just shook their heads and said not to talk about it because it had scared all the ladies. I'm sure many people have heard about the Min Min lights in western Queensland. Whatever these ladies knew about whatever I saw in our location, they were convinced that it wasn't something you wanted to meet in a desert at night. I only ever saw this once. I only saw it for maybe a minute, and it just looked like a car headlight a couple of kilometers away up the road. But I'll tell you what, if the ladies that come from this area, and whose people have survived in this desolate, remote part of the continent for 60,000 years, are worried to the point of all being scared, I certainly don't want to mess with whatever it is. My cousin is with the Forest Service in the Montana, Wyoming area, and I decided to go up there with her to literally test the waters. She does hydrology and has to ride out to the middle of nowhere to test streams and snow runoff to ensure no contaminants. So I thought that sounded fun and wanted to do a bit of a tour with her. We were going to have to camp out there for two nights, so we packed up all of our gear in saddlebags and started out. The first day and night was amazing. Beautiful scenery and amazing air quality. It really is so peaceful out there. I love that area and wish I got to go up there more often. Anyway, we started out on the second day and my cousin said, you want to see something weird? Of course I said yes. So she led me to a bit of a side journey into this tiny little ravine. We ended up traveling two hours away from our actual path we'd laid out. At the very end of this fold in the land, she dismounts and tells me to get off my horse too. We tie them up in this gorgeous little clearing and she tells me to follow this tiny wildlife path and to bring our little rechargeable radio. It's one of those you can plug in or wind up and it also acts as a lantern if you really need it to, but that kills the batteries quickly. I do, and out in the middle of nowhere, 
there's a huge coil of wire sticking out of the ground. The wire itself was not weirdly large, like some buried transmission wire, but small, like 10 or 12 gauge wiring for a house. They trailed off into the brush and trees, so naturally, I decided to follow the damn thing out of curiosity. My cousin trails behind me as I do, and this wire, after coming straight up from the ground, is strung across the limbs of trees, then back to the ground. Then it snakes around rocks and finally deadens into an outlet. That outlet is mounted on the side of a desk. It looks like a school teacher's desk from when I was growing up with a metal base and a pseudo-wood plastic top thing. No chair, no building, no nothing. Just this outlet and this desk. I'm staring, confused as hell, at this desk in the middle of the forest when my cousin takes the radio, pulls out the cord, and plugs it into the outlet. It lit up and started blaring static. The wire was being fed from somewhere, now, the place where we were had no road access, no buildings for many miles, and no other people around. And yet, there was a live outlet. It was weird. I live in Kansas and have driven that west stretch many times on my way to Colorado. It's absolutely nothing for so long, and the few tiny towns you do pass are mostly run down nothings as well. I've never had to drive it in the dark, but I would easily get spooked. And for whatever reason, we seem to have a lot of people in this stupid state that like to mess with you late at night on the interstate if you're the only two cars around. Three significant times I remember where one of those assholes would pass me, slow down in front of me until I had to pass them, for them to then speed back up, stay beside me for long, get back in front of me, and repeat until we came across another car, and they started on them while I fly forward to get away. I had someone once follow me into a toll line where several others were open and empty, I had a K-tag and the worker waved me through, but I stopped and told her the vehicle behind me had been following me for miles and miles, how they were passing and slowing down, and now followed me into this lane. She told me they didn't have a K-tag, so she would make sure to take her time in getting their money to give me time to get ahead. Well, they then come back up and go into another lane. She tells me to sit and wait for them to drive on, and turned on the red X so no other cars would come behind me. The other car waited about two minutes, just sitting there. The lady called the other worker in the stand and told them to get them out because they'd been following me, and they were being really sketchy. They finally pulled off and drove slowly down the highway. I sat at her toll for about five more minutes, I got off on the very first exit and went through town to get to a road that led to my home a few miles outside of town, because I was afraid that car may have pulled over on the highway ahead to wait for me. This was about two in the morning also. Fuck people who do that shit. It's extremely creepy and unsettling. I used to deliver hotshot freight across the Great Plains, Minnesota area. One night around 2 a.m., I was hauling across North Dakota trying to reach Montana by morning. I was delivering a particularly valuable tractor part that a farm desperately needed for the following day. I began to notice some highway hypnosis sneaking up on me, but it didn't really bother me because I'd been through it a hundred times before. Anyone who's driven across North Dakota knows that it's incredibly flat, like really flat. There also tends to be very straight and long roads. It's somewhat easy to see things on the road that are far away, even at night. I noticed something large on the road, 
spanning my entire lane, approximately half a mile in front of me. I slowed down a bit and prepared to move in the opposite lane, thinking it was some retread off a blown tire. As I got closer, I noticed it was two people, laying head to toe across the entire lane. I swerved into the other lane, successfully avoiding them, and came to an almost complete stop, but they didn't move. Not an inch. I was just about to back up and check on them when I remembered a story that an old graybeard colleague of mine told me. He told me that in certain remote areas, people will lie down in the middle of the road and wait for a car or truck to stop and see what's going on. At that point, the road layers along with whoever else is hiding in the nearby bushes will beat the shit out of the driver and steal his vehicle, leaving him in the middle of nowhere. I decided not to back up, and when the two people in the road saw me put my truck back in gear and drive away, they both got up and walked toward the shoulder. I called the police and explained what had happened but we were so far away from civilization that I doubt anything came of it. Thanks to that old gray beard, I got to keep my truck, my job, and my teeth. I was driving on a cross-country road trip through the middle of nowhere, Kansas, when one of my tires blew out. I pulled over and went to call AAA, but I had no service on my phone. So I got out and started the process of trying to change the tire myself. After a very short while, a cop pulled up and asked if I needed help. I said yes thank you officer, and he said, cause you're in luck. It just so happens I know the best tow truck driver. He could take you into town and get you all fixed up, no problem. The mosquitoes were eating me alive, and frankly, I only had a donut-style replacement tire and no clue how to properly change it. So I said, yes please, and the officer gave the tow truck a call. After another short while, the tow truck arrived and the officer left. The driver asked, where am I towing you to? So I said, I'm not sure, to town I guess, somewhere where I can get my tire fixed. He said, well you're in luck, cause I know the guy at the only place that's open right now who can fix that for you. I said, okay, sounds good, and he towed us to the auto repair place. This was basically a ghost town if you could even call it a town. The tow truck driver and the repair guy sat around and bullshitted for a couple of hours while my tire was being fixed. Bear in mind, there was nobody else there but me and my passengers. There was nobody else anywhere within sight. The town was empty, except for the gas station connected to the repair place. Finally, they came out and said I was all set and gave me both my bills. $1,200 in total, for one tire and a five-mile tow, for a 1991 Grand Am that wasn't even worth that much. I was furious, but had no options, so I gave him my credit card and he said, Sorry guy, we're a cash-only kind of town. I said, Okay then, well I don't have any cash on me, so how are we going to settle this up? Well... You're in luck, cause there's an ATM next door at the gas station my buddy owns, he said. So I went to the gas station and took out the maximum I could on four different cards, each with a $20 withdrawal fee. I looked behind the counter and in addition to the gas station attendant, there stood the cop, the tow truck driver, and the repair guy, all munching on Doritos and having a good laugh. I'm pretty sure I got hosed, and potentially maybe even sabotaged. Looking back, that cop sure arrived really quickly, and my other three tires were all still relatively new. I had to cut my trip short and invest in cortisone cream 
with a million mosquito bites. So back when I was younger, I was kind of a terrible kid to deal with, being totally unmanageable as well as being a child of two narcissists. The decision was made that I would work on a huge ranch deep into the sticks of Arizona. There were some actually really good things to come of this, but I digress. On cattle drives, it was not unusual to stumble upon horses, encampments, and even whole towns, also in the middle of nowhere. These all had their own movie-like situations that came out of them, but one in particular I will never forget. Here we are on another cattle drive, this time pretty far into it. We've been out in the desert, if I remember correctly, easily three or more weeks, when we stumble upon this town in the middle of the canyon. That is picture perfect, and in addition there's a diner. It's like an old, totally chromed out East Coast diner. We had not eaten anything of real substance for a while, and the head wrangler promised me a milkshake for my birthday. I was beyond stoked, if not a little weirded out. But honestly, after you spend enough time in the wilderness of the US, nothing really surprises me. So we leave behind some of our mates to watch the cattle, who are resting in the shade after getting over this rocky wash and a hike into the canyon to go to the diner. The second we set foot in the diner, the head guy, this older cowboy who's the head of all of us, grabs my arm. This place is packed and everyone is wearing odd clothing, like stuff from maybe the 40s or 50s. My head wrangler is a really tough guy who's been ranching for his entire life and he's definitely seen some stuff. T grabs my arm when I realize everyone is just staring at us, and there's a really strange feeling in the air. Now, we were used to getting looks all the time from being smelly and dirty, but these people looked almost in fear and shock. T and two others with us slowly back out of the diner, dragging me in tow and we immediately go back to our site and leave without a word. I was so confused, I just went along with all of it. To this day, I have no idea what that place was, or if we stumbled through a time warp or what, but my wrangler told me later that night, when we were away from them, that he felt like we stepped back in time. Like truly stepped back in time and that place was stuck in some sort of loop, and if we stayed, we would get stuck too. T never really spoke a lot, nor was he to be messed with. He also had a mean sweet tooth despite having almost no teeth, so for him to have reacted that way really shook me. I have no idea if what he told me was true, but I will never forget the look of all those people in that immaculate diner. I'm an airline pilot and I have two stories to share. In the air, probably the creepiest thing I've heard was the distress call of a small general aviation aircraft going down. This was around 2014 in the Pacific Northwest. He'd just blown a cylinder head and oil was shooting out all over his windshield. You could hear the panic in his voice as he radioed out that he couldn't see and was trying to report his position to a few airliners so they could relay it to ATC. I checked the news that night, and he actually died in the crash. It was a pretty eerie feeling that we'd heard the last words of a pilot fighting for his life, while we were just cruising along above the clouds at 35,000 feet, completely powerless to do anything other than to reach out to him over the radio. For my second story, one of the creepiest destinations I've flown to was Ciudad Juarez. Me and two flight attendants were bored on an El Paso layover, so we decided to get drinks around 11pm. We drank until the bars closed at 2, and on the way out, 
We asked the bartender if anything else was still open. Not unless you want to go to see it at Juarez, he joked. I looked at the flight attendants. We shrugged, nodded, and said, Okay. He was shocked that we took him seriously. We walked the short distance back to the hotel, grabbed our passports, and set out for Mexico. Before we left, I asked the flight attendants, who were both women, if they were sure they were okay with this. Yeah, sure, as long as you're coming too. Liquid courage had finally overruled any fears of being kidnapped or beheaded. And off we went. So we walked 20 minutes south to the border. El Paso was completely dead quiet, aside from a few homeless people. Some of them were stumbling around and clearly under the influence of drugs. But none of them bothered us. We reached the Mexican border, and the guards took an extra second to look at the three crazy gringos before waving us through. It was close to 3 a.m. at this point, and we were three twenty-somethings wandering around the streets of Ciudad Juarez at night. I'm not sure how much you know about this place, but it isn't exactly safe at night, especially for non-locals. The streets were pretty empty, and not a single bar was open. But everyone we passed stopped mid-conversation and stared at us as we walked by. The flight attendants were getting nervous and they were walking so close to me that we were brushing up against each other. After determining that everything within realistic distance of the border was closed, we turned around to head back to the US. We'd probably been in Ciudad Juarez for around an hour and somehow managed to navigate down the dark and deserted streets onto the same strip that we entered on. By this point, we were close enough to the border that there were a few street lights that were still on. All of a sudden, two locals stumbled out from the dark sidewalks into the street, which we were walking down the middle of. As they came into the light, all three of us jumped at what we saw. A man and a woman, both with scarred faces, hunched backs, excessive sweat, ripped clothing, and missing teeth were grinning as they approached us. The man was half speaking Spanish, half laughing. The startle factor of their approach, combined with their appearance, stands out as one of the biggest jump scares of my life. After realizing they weren't trying to kill us, yet, I figured, screw it, we'd come this far why not throw a Hail Mary? To my own disbelief, I actually tried to communicate with the man and asked if he knew of any bars that were open. By this point, the flight attendants were so terrified that each one latched themselves onto one of my arms. In any situation other than the one we were currently in, I'd have looked pretty cool. The man simply smiled, pointed behind him, and said, over there. There was a motel with the lights turned off, except for a steady red light on the front balcony and a light flickering from inside a room on the second floor. One of the flight attendants turned and said into my ear, No. Fuck no. We need to leave now. I thanked the man and woman for their time, and we hightailed it to the U.S. border. They gave us a thorough questioning, and rightfully so, as one man and two women crossing into the U.S. at around 4 a.m. reeks of human trafficking. Weirdly, the number of people huddled on the streets of El Paso had doubled, and we sped walked back to our hotel. That layover definitely takes the cake for creepiest thing to happen in the middle of nowhere. I'm a biologist that has to do field work surveying unmaintained private properties in the middle of nowhere. Long story short, we find a body face up in a stream, deep in a thickly wooded wetland. The body looked several months old at least. No clothes, no tools, no shelter, nothing nearby to suggest who he is or how he got there. 
We couldn't even tell race or gender from what we saw. We call the police and they immediately tell us it's probably the missing person who ditched his car nearby. They apparently searched for weeks with dogs, horses, and ATVs, but didn't find any sign of the guy. All they found was his family car loaded with cash and a handgun. They also tell us he seemed to be running from someone or something. Real or imagined, they weren't sure. Apparently, the man didn't even close his car door, just ditched it at the rail crossing and took off running into the woods in a tremendous hurry. I find his clothes about 30 yards up the stream bank from where the body was found. His pants were neatly folded and placed on top of his nice brown loafers, underpants and socks on top of those. He placed his glasses atop his socks, very orderly and in a nice pile. His shirt and undershirt were hanging from a tree branch right above those as if to dry. I mean, the whole thing creeps me out even a year on, but what unsettles me is the fact that he ran from his family, drove several hours from his home, ditched his car, and fought a mile through briars and thick woods, only to stop and carefully fold and hang his clothes before meeting his end. I look him up every now and then, and still can't find any more information about what happened or why. Trucker here. I think the best, creepy thing that has ever happened to me was when I was heading from Tucson, Arizona, up into Salt Lake City, Utah. Well, this was a few years ago, and the main highway had been taken out in a flash flood. It was under construction, so I had to take a weird detour through the mountains in lower Utah. It was getting late, and I was getting tired, so I pulled off onto the shoulder and went to sleep in my bunk. Now, this was in the middle of nowhere. The closest town was like 40 miles away, so it's completely pitch black outside once I turned the lights off. Anyway... Around 4 a.m. I wake up, because I'm hearing something messing with my trunk. It's like playing with the air and power cables between my cab and the trailer, which is literally six inches from where my head is at, but on the outside of the cab. Then I feel something climb onto the landing that's on the back of my truck, and it shakes my whole truck, so I'm guessing something around two to three hundred pounds was climbing around back there. I'm thinking like a mountain lion or a bear. At this point I'm wide the fuck awake, and I want to get this thing away from me. So I slam my hand into my cab wall, trying to scare whatever is out there. I slam hard enough to really make it loud. I then hear someone, a male, scream bloody murder. I hear them fall off the back of my truck. I then hear about 15 other people all around my truck yelling. I climb up front, turn on my lights, and illuminate a squad of army reserves doing their midnight ruck march and capture drills. Turns out, these guys were supposed to find an abandoned truck and secure it for their midnight drills. That truck was three miles back down the road. They were not expecting me to be sleeping there and thought I was part of the drill. I'm ex-military, so after explaining I was not part of their test, and legit was just out there out of coincidence, we laughed it off. They had to radio their CO and tell them I was there, and not have the other squads bother me. I'm not necessarily a trucker, but I'm a commercial delivery driver in a rural area in the Midwestern U.S. Randomly one day as I'm leaving our home store, the radio just stopped working in the store. We thought nothing of it, and I left to start the day, and they just turned off the radio in the store and continued their day. I start the car, and boom, the radio wasn't working. But, it wasn't working in every single station. 
so I thought that was weird and decided to go back into the store and ask them to see if it was that way on their radio. Same thing. I go out to my personal car. No radio. I call my fiancé and best friend, who are on the complete opposite side of the country, where it's not rural. No radio. I call my mom. Nothing on her end. Everyone I worked with called surrounding stores and customers, and they had nothing. It was a weird blackout. So I finally ended up leaving for the day's deliveries. I left the radio on in the background, even though it was static, just for some sort of noise. The volume was really low, but out of nowhere, a faint talking can be heard, and it was going in and out. It was a language I didn't recognize at all and I honestly don't even know what to compare it to. It sounded like a female computerized voice. Oddly though, my store's radio caught it as well, as they later told me they heard it too. After that, it was static again for a few hours. Then slowly, one by one, stations came back up. Now, this is so easy to probably have an explanation to, but the weirdest thing about it was that there was no media attention to it, and no radio station mentioned anything about the hours-long blackout. It was like it never happened. What freaks me out about this was the complete silence about it, and how no one was given an explanation. This happened about two years ago. I just moved about an hour and a half away from home, the first time I'd lived away from home. I was working on a kid's activity camp. All the staff lived in two massive cabins in the woods. There were about 40 people in each, two or three to a room, so you can imagine how big this cabin was. Anyway, everybody became really close. Some people knew each other from previous years working at this particular camp. None of us really locked our doors because we all knew each other and everybody hung out in different friends' rooms all the time. On this camp, my job was working with the kids during the day and doing evening shifts on the bar, which was there for the staff and the teachers and the parents that had come with the children. One night, my roommate and I were both working an evening shift on the bar. She was finishing a couple of hours earlier as she was on a different shift. My roommate, Debs, decided that she was just going back to the room to read and wait for me to finish so we could watch a movie together. She'd been gone for about five minutes when my phone started ringing with her caller ID. I picked up the call as the bar was pretty dead that night. The only people in there were staff. When I picked up the phone call, nobody was saying anything on the other end. I put this down to her just butt-dialing me by accident and hung up. About a minute later, I get another phone call from a friend that lived across the hallway from us. She told me that I needed to come back to the room now, so I asked the guy I was working with to cover while I popped back to the room quickly. I walked down the hallway and there were about five people just standing outside of my room. I walk inside and Debs is just standing there crying, which isn't at all like her. Our stuff is all over our room. Please note, this is very weird because I'm pretty sure I have OCD. I often tidied my side and her side of the room, even if she didn't want me to. She went on to tell me that her phone had gone missing. I then asked her about phoning me before I came back to the room, and she had no idea what I was talking about. This meant someone had taken her phone and knew who to call straight away. Also, when she left work, there would be no point in stealing her phone as it was literally worthless. It was a $10 mobile at the most. A few days later, we started noticing that things had gone missing, but it wasn't normal things people would steal. They could have taken laptops, Kindles, a PlayStation and some games. Instead, all they took were my bra and knickers, some clean and some from the dirty washing. This made me feel sick, especially because we knew everyone that worked and lived there. 
For a few days, I kept getting these phone calls from Debs' phone, with just silence on the other end. We obviously went and reported it, and our bosses said they would look into it. We kinda got blamed for leaving our door unlocked, which I understand is being really stupid now. The creepy thing was, a few days later, I walked into the staff lounge, and Debs' phone was just placed on the windowsill. Nobody was in there, and nobody seemed to be around. Well, at that point, I noped out of there as fast as I could and locked myself in my room until Debs came back. Nothing ever came out of it, and we never found out who it was, but I definitely have a feeling it was someone that knew us quite well, and they knew when we would both be out of our room. For the life of me, I still don't know who stole my underwear, my roommate's phone, and who trashed our room but I have definitely learned a lesson, and that's not to leave my door unlocked, because there are gross creepers out there. This happened one summer when I was 12 to 13. It was before cell phones were common. My mother rented a cabin that we would stay at four hours north of our home. My father could not attend due to the fact that he was working, but that was fine with him. We drove up to the cabin. It was cute enough from the outside. There were several cookie cutter cabins you could rent that all arched around in a C-shape with parking spots in front and at the front of the line of cabins was where the owner of the cabin stayed. In the front desk area, if you will. Anyway, when we first arrived, we were the only people there. No other cabins had been rented out, even though it was August and this area, although semi-remote, is a tourist destination. The gentleman that worked at the front desk came out to greet us. I didn't pay too much attention due to the fact I was 12 and excited for the fun outdoors adventure that my mother and I were going to have. Well, I remember him giving my mom the keys and saying, The bathroom window is broken and does not close all the way or lock. We thought it was strange, but kind of shrugged it off. After a day of adventure, we went out, came back in at dusk, and we went to bed. The next morning, Saturday, we woke up and went to get in the truck. It would not start. Strange. I will admit, at the time, it was a newer SUV. I don't recall what was wrong with it, but I remember the owner of the cabins coming out and saying, Oh, your truck is broke. Too bad. Let me call someone. My mom insisted she could call someone and went into his office and used the phone. She called someone to come and fix it. As we were waiting for someone to get there, the owner came out and said, did you guys have any problems with the power last night? My mom and I shook our heads, confused. Oh, well, sometimes in that cabin, the power will randomly go out. All you have to do is come out here and flip the breaker. He then proceeded to show my mom where the breaker was. After getting the truck fixed, having another day of adventure, we came back, ready to settle in for the night. As we were sitting in bed watching television, the power went out. It didn't flicker, just boom, out. My mom grabbed a flashlight she'd packed, and we went out there and turned the breaker back on. At this point, we were feeling incredibly uneasy, like anyone would be. We got back in bed, and about ten minutes later, the power went out again. My mom jumped up and ran outside, only to see a man running away from the fuse box. We hightailed it out of there so fast. Luckily, everything had been packed because we were leaving the next day. So I've been on Grinder for about 10 years five of which were illegal and I'm not proud of it. I've had plenty of messed up experiences. 
This one in particular reminds me of a story when I was at a party without my car. My phone was on 10%, but a decently hot grinder guy said he could pick me up, and that we could hang at his place before he drove me home. So of course I jumped on the opportunity. Anyway, we got to his place and he got me pretty drunk, but he never tried to make a move. I assumed he was going to wait and just convince me to stay the night later. Finally, my phone died after like two hours. I didn't even have to say anything before he noticed it was dead. Then he stood up and said, Well, let's go to the car then. When I asked if he had a charger I could use, he just said, No. After we got in the car, he got kind of quiet and less flirty. I spaced out, just enjoying his music and looking out of the window. I didn't even notice that he never asked where I lived, until I realized we'd been driving for over an hour. Not even towards my town, but into the canyons. It was Greater Salt Lake City, Utah area. I asked where he was going, and he just said, I thought we could just go for a drive. And my drunk ass was like, oh, okay. So anyway, to make a long story shorter, he ended up taking us four or five miles down a dirt road with no signs or houses until it dead-ended into this cabin with no lights on or cars outside. He parked and turned the car off. That's when the dread started to creep in as I sobered up. I said I drank too much and should probably head home, but he didn't even respond. He just sat there, staring at the cabin. Then he said, You said you like being kinky. You were pretty submissive, correct? Uh, sure. But I just meant like, normal rough kind of stuff. Nothing wild, I replied. He started sounding a bit annoyed, and his sentences seemed a little less carefully worded. Kind of like he was just spitting out the bare minimum of each thought. He said something about how some of his favorite people are those who can find pleasure in pain. And if someone goes into shock enough times, eventually it becomes like a drug and they crave more. And something about how pushing a person into the deep end is the fastest way to teach them to swim. At that point, I was scared enough to assert myself. And I said firmly, Okay, well, that sounds fun, but just not tonight. I just want to go home now. This place is creepy. And he just sighed and gripped his keys tighter. Then right as I glanced at his phone sitting in the cup holder, right before it occurred to me to grab it, he snatched it up so fast and held it in his left hand, kind of behind his head, to make it clear he wasn't going to let me near it. I made kind of this, what? Sound. And he just gave me this almost. I'm proud of you, son. Half smile like dads do when they pat your shoulder or something. It was quiet and he kept looking me up and down for a minute or so. And then got a little more gruff and said, Let's go inside. I have these friends you'll really like once you meet them. You'll feel a lot better. Or something to that extent. But he wasn't even trying to sound genuine or comforting like he'd been doing so well earlier in the night. Finally, I lied and spoke up a bit. I told my roommates and my friend I was meeting up with you before you picked me up. I sent screenshots of your face and some of the conversation. They're gonna freak out if I don't charge my phone and reply to them in the next few hours. I lied. I tried to not make it sound accusatory, but more like I was just worried about my friends going crazy but it was clear he knew what I was implying. At that point, he let out an exasperated grunty sigh and started the car and drove away. Driving back, I got nervous about him stalking me and coming after me in the future, so I tried to apologize and tell him I'd be down to hang out another time maybe, but tonight just wasn't great for me. Blah, blah, blah. He didn't say a single word the whole drive back. He didn't ask where I lived, but he dropped me off at a McDonald's about 40 miles from my apartment, and when I was stepping out of the car, 
He suddenly leaned over and gave me a hard shove. I almost fell out the rest of the way. He grabbed my backpack off the floor and flung it out of his window across the parking lot. He peeled out with the passenger door still open. He broke my laptop and cracked my phone, and I had to ask a stranger to use her charger and call an Uber. But at that point, I was just so anxious to get home. I didn't give a shit. What's so weird is how, while it was happening, even though I was terrified, I guess I wasn't thinking about exactly what he was planning to do with me. I just knew I needed to get away. So it wasn't until I got home and got in the shower that I realized how messed up it all was and what might have happened if I'd let him walk me into the cabin and all that stuff. I remember just being so shaken and smacked by the reality of it. It almost felt like a panic attack. So I sat down in the shower with my head between my knees and I cried until it ran cold. I got out and woke up my roommate to tell him all about it. He calmed me down a bit. So while I still have an active grinder account, I really just use it as an ego boost. I'm reluctant to meet up with anyone from it now. Anyway, girls and gays, I suppose the moral of the story is that we gotta be damn careful out there. In high school, I had to write a paper which summarized my life story, starting from birth. I reflected on my earliest memories, and when I remembered this, I had to sit down. My heart pounded as I realized what had actually happened, and what my four-year-old self couldn't understand. When I was a kid, my family often vacationed with their friends' families, and we'd all lived together in a giant beach house or cabin for a week. This must have been one of the first of those vacations. I wanted to hang out with the rest of the kids, but since they were all at least one year older than me, they thought I was uncool. I followed my sister around the house, but since she didn't want to play with me, I mostly just eavesdropped on everybody's conversations. One day, all the kids happened to be in one room, no adults, plenty of toys. Hella fun. Off to the side was this tiny door, the tiniest I'd ever seen, which led to a dark, empty room. I remember we were absolutely fascinated by that tiny door, and the older kids would make up stories about it. Jennifer was the eldest, and in my memories she's a teenager but that might have been skewed since I thought everyone in the double digits was super mature. She even knew how to use her mom's cell phone. All the kids were playing, having fun, enjoying their childhood. Then Jennifer got a call. She had to ask us to be quiet several times, and she sounded really serious. I thought this request was silly and a little annoying, since I really wanted to play. And the call ended. Jennifer told us, My dad is coming back here soon. Jennifer's dad had driven away for a few hours, but now was driving back. Someone asked questions about where he went and what he was doing. I think she said something about drinking. At some point, Jennifer addressed all of us and said something like, My dad looks at kids and takes them on drives. You all have to be really careful when he comes back. I couldn't grasp anything else, she said. Then she talked to a girl and a boy. I noticed he was looking at you two a lot, so both of you have to be really, really careful. I think he wants to take each of you on a drive, but don't go with him if he asks. Their conversation went on for a while, and I felt jealous that they talked so much with Jennifer and that her dad was looking at them instead of me. Why wasn't I so special? I grew bored of listening to them and went back to playing. The car pulled up and Jennifer told us to go in the tiny door room. We brought some toys along. I was psyched to go through the tiny door, but it ended up being a dark, empty room without any fairies or hobbits. After a while, we left. 
As far as I know, nothing bad happened on that trip. I grew up with the two kids Jennifer talked to, and they seemed pretty well adjusted. But Jennifer and her family never vacationed with us again. I told my family this story, and they thought it was an imaginary memory that my four-year-old brain concocted. My parents are positive that there weren't any weird, creepy, or alcoholic dads there, just their good friends. My sister didn't remember any of it. I can't rationalize how or why I would have imagined it. My childhood was great. I had no concept of anything bad until I was like 11. Luckily, this experience did not ruin tiny doors for me in the slightest. I love me some tiny doors. So me, my boyfriend, his best friend and his girlfriend drove up to Big Bear. Then a day later, another friend of ours drove up. He was supposed to sleep downstairs and couples sleep upstairs, since there's only two bedrooms. The first night we stayed there, it was kind of creepy because the cabin was pretty remote, and of course there's absolutely no lights outside. It's the woods with coyotes howling and bears, but nonetheless completely normal activity. On the night that our friend drove up at around 12am, my boyfriend and I were in bed when suddenly our friend sleeping downstairs comes banging on the door, freaking out, saying he saw shadows in the woods, and that the motion light came on and that there was thumping outside. We got a little freaked out, but my boyfriend gets out of bed and checks the entire cabin. He even goes outside. Nothing. We go up to the other couple's room where there's a porch with a sliding glass door that looks out into the woods. It's important to note that I'm a naturally very anxious and scared person, while my boyfriend is a rock. He's calm and logical, while I tend to jump to the worst case scenario. My boyfriend goes over to check the last place in the cabin, so he pulls the curtain and jumps and yells, Oh my god. At this point, I'm terrified. My boyfriend is a 180 pound CrossFit coach, and to see a big guy like that scared is nauseating. He locked the door and backed away slowly. He quietly says, There's a large man standing outside staring at us. He's just standing in the woods looking at us. At this point, I'm thinking he's messing with me. He looks at me and says, Go lock the door. That's when I knew he was serious. Everyone is freaking out. I run and lock the door behind us, and we all decide to stay in the room to keep an eye out. It's the middle of summer, and it's really hot, but we refuse to open the window. I'm so scared, but trying not to show it, as everyone else seemed to have calmed down. About 30 minutes go by, nothing happens. I get annoyed with the heat and the fact that there's five people in a tiny room, and three of them are men, so my boyfriend and I go back to our room. I'm still pretty spooked, so my boyfriend tries to cheer me up. At this point, it's about 1.30am. I told him I was too scared to sleep with the lights off. He tells me that it's totally fine and he understands. So we just lay with the lights completely on. Finally, I start drifting to sleep when I hear a thud. I sit up and look at my boyfriend. He looks at me. And then the power cuts. I immediately start sobbing. I'm trembling and I can't see anything because it's pitch black. I try to get out of bed and run, but my legs get tangled in the sheets and I fall. My boyfriend picks me up and we grab our phone and run to the other room where everyone else was staying. I'm hysterical at this point. I try to contact our host, but nothing will go through. I try to call my dad, but all of our phones say no service. We are alone out there. Thank God the friend who drove up after us had a different carrier, because his phone had one bar. So he calls the local sheriff. He's on the phone with them, and they transfer us to the utilities company. We give the address, and they tell us we're too far in the woods, and they don't cover that area. 
At this point, we're wondering if the entire area has no power, or if the man outside had just cut our power. I cry more and we call 911 to report suspicious activity and a power outage. They send the fire department. A few hours go by and it's 3am and suddenly the power comes back on. We fall asleep and the next day we talk to some of the locals of the area. We told them our power went out and he said that was strange and shouldn't have happened. He told us the only reason that happens out there is because of a snowstorm. He said he couldn't explain it. So, to the man in the woods who might have cut our power, let's not meet. This story starts out with four of my friends who are Adam, Frank, Randy, and Jay. Adam booked an Airbnb for his birthday, and we were planning to just relax and drop some acid. Me, Adam, and Randy have done acid in the past, and it was a great experience. For background purposes, I've experimented heavily with acid for the past three years, dropping upwards to almost five tabs at once so I know what to expect when doing acid. However, this trip caught me completely off guard. Frank and Jay have always been curious about acid and wanted to drop it with us for their first time. We're all close friends, so we thought it'd be a nice experience to try. So, we get to our Airbnb, which is a cozy two-story wooded cabin. We all decided to take one tab each, Frank and Jay were hesitant on taking one full tab, but eventually agreed to it since we were all going to take one full tab. This is where I should have realized that maybe we should have taken half or even a quarter since I didn't know the dosage of each tab. However, I've always got acid from this dealer and knew he was a reliable source, as my previous trips were always safe regarding the doses and legitimacy of the LSD. Okay. Now we all take the tab at 3 p.m. For the first 45 minutes, it was all going well. We were watching the Garden of Words and talking about life and our relationships and such. About another 45 minutes pass, and this is where the red flags start popping up. We all decide to go downstairs and just chill while I make food. Frank, Adam, and Randy are starting to lose themselves. Their sentences become incoherent and are unable to understand what me and Jay are saying. Even though it was Jay's first time taking acid, he held himself together quite well and was taking care of Frank, Adam, and Randy. Adam then stubs his toe on a chair and starts bleeding. This is when the nightmare starts. Adam is in pain and he starts to say, security check, about every 20 seconds. I believe the injury towards Adam's toe started making him paranoid about the whole cabin as he rented it in his name and wanted to make sure it's safe and such. So, for about 30 to 40 minutes, he's repeating the phrase, security check. During this time frame, Frank and Randy are tripping out hard. They're starting to lose themselves completely. Frank is talking incoherent gibberish with Adam while Adam is in pain and repeating security check. Randy is sitting down by himself, completely out of his mind. He couldn't understand a word I said or what was going on. So me and Jay help the three of them upstairs to relax and lay down a bit. I bring up the food I made while Adam is still saying security check over and over. This is when Randy and Frank fall asleep. We had some nice lo-fi beats playing to lighten the mood. However, I don't think this helped. Me and Jay are still in our right mind and just chilling until Frank wakes up and starts acting strange. He tried doing a judo move on Jay. Jay thought this was normal behavior because we're into combat sports and spar a lot. This was the first big red flag. Frank then goes to me to try a judo flip on me but I counter it and we end up in bed. I asked him if he's good, then he quickly replied, Yeah, I'm good. It was awkwardly fast. Every time he talked, it was like he was rapping like Eminem. 
this is when stuff gets weird. Frank then goes to Randy, who is sleeping, and proceeds to gouge his face out while asking Randy if he's okay. Frank keeps his fingernails really long for some reason, so if he goes to Randy's eyes, it would have been bad. We move Randy away from Frank and try to get him to relax a bit because right now, me and Jay start to realize that Frank is not okay. Frank then starts to flip out. He falls onto the floor, then slams his leg onto Randy's head, who is sleeping on the floor. Frank is still out of control, rolling on the floor back and forth and getting into weird, contorted positions. It was like his body was from the movie The Exorcist. He was also chanting and mumbling random stuff while flipping out on the floor, like a psychotic crackhead. At this point, Adam is coming back to his senses. He looks at Frank in confusion. Now this is when it really hits the fan. Upon seeing this, I go to the speaker to turn down the music. This is when Frank stands up and walks towards me, asking me what I'm doing. I say, just turning the music down bro, as I'm still a bit freaked out by him. He pushes me violently aside and proceeds to grab the speaker. He smashes it on the ground. He then grabs the cord that was attached to the speaker and pulls on it while screaming. What does it all mean? At the top of his lungs. This scares the life out of me, Adam and Jay. All while Randy is still asleep through all of this. At this point, we're all freaked out by what Frank does. Frank proceeds to walk to the staircase, but along the way, he palm strikes Randy, who's starting to sit up. This causes Randy to fall back to the ground and go to sleep again. I'm not sure if it knocked him out or what. Frank also strikes me in the jaw right after hitting Randy, causing my jaw to slightly dislocate. While this is happening, Adam tells him to chill out, and I kid you not, Frank responds in the most demonic voice. Chill out. No, you chill out. He sounded like a legit satanic demon saying that. After Frank hit my jaw, my first instinct is to clinch and take him to the ground. We hit the ground and I pin him with the help of Jay. Remember, this is Jay's first time taking acid as well, so he's freaking out by whatever was happening to Frank. Frank is violent and he's strong as hell on the ground. He's struggling and chanting random stuff to himself like he's possessed or something. He breaks free a couple of times and attacks everyone. He smashed Adam's face in with a closed fist repeatedly until I got him off him. He was kicking anyone in front of him as we tried to pin him, even trying to bite us. He would scratch, hit, bite, or do anything he could do to harm us. Every time we pin him, he arched his back like that one scene from The Exorcist where the girl is walking down the stairs like a spider. Thank God I knew Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu because Frank looked like he was set on killing all of us. This was a nightmare. His pupils were dilated to the point where his whole eye was just black. He would glare at me and Jay as we pinned him down and this was so creepy I thought he was a demon. Frank is screaming gibberish and making weird noises while trying to contort his body like the girl from The Exorcist. At times he would arch his back and stick his tongue out while trying to throw up, while making the most demonic noises I've ever heard. What he was doing was straight up from a horror movie, and it creeped me out. At 8pm, this is when Randy wakes up. He couldn't believe what was happening. He thought that he had died during the acid trip and he was now in hell. Reason being is that Randy sees that I'm bleeding and my face is swollen while pinning down Frank with Jay, all while Adam is having a mental breakdown witnessing this. Randy says to himself, Frank would never hurt us like this. This isn't real. It's just a dream. He then proceeds to scream, Jesus Christ, at the top of his lungs repeatedly. The screaming triggers Frank to fight us even harder. Randy screams Jesus Christ and recites Bible verses for at least three hours while Frank was trying to fight us. During those three hours, me and Jay are pinning down Frank, who's tripping out harder and harder as Randy keeps screaming Jesus Christ repeatedly. Frank then screams and makes demonic throw-up noises while trying to get loose as a response to Randy's religious babble. Imagine this, 
One guy screaming Jesus Christ repeatedly and saying Bible verses at the top of his lungs, while another guy is actively trying to harm you as you pin him down, all while you're tripping on acid still. It was a nightmare to say the least. The screaming, chanting, and constant fear of being maimed was all that me, Adam, and Jay could think of at the time. Adam recollects himself and begins watching Randy and calming him down while trying to get him to be quiet, as the neighbors around our Airbnb are still awake. 11pm hits and Randy snaps out of it. A few minutes later, Frank then snaps out of it. I didn't know for sure if he was back to normal, as he asked us for water and stopped fighting us. Me and Jay cautiously let him up. However, Frank has his back turned toward me. In case he went apeshit again, I could quickly get to his back and choke him out, so we could restrain him. However, he was normal again. Me, Adam, and Jay experienced the chaos and destruction done by Frank and Randy, who weren't aware of what they were doing during their psychotic trip. This trip made me realize acid is not for everyone, and that we should have taken some precautions beforehand. Psychedelics can either be a heavenly experience or a hellish nightmare that won't end. Frank and Randy didn't realize how serious the situation was until we told them afterwards. To be honest, I'm not sure if they realize the severity of what me, Jay, and Adam experienced that night. I thought I knew what I was getting into but I will think twice the next time I try LSD with anyone. We all remain friends to this day, but me, Adam, and Jay will remember the nightmare hell of a trip that we experienced. This trip will forever be ingrained in my mind as the worst LSD trip I've ever experienced in my life. I needed to get this one off my chest. This is a story of my first encounter with the paranormal that I can remember. I was about eight or nine years old, playing with my little cousins at their parents' house during a family gathering. Behind their house is a large forest located in northeast Florida. My cousins, their neighbor, and I were playing hide-and-seek in the forest, and the only rule their parents had was to stay within sight of the house. Of course we didn't listen. I was getting bored of the game and wanted to do some exploring. I convinced the other kids to join me as we headed deeper into the forest. I noticed this ball of light floating in midair. I thought I was seeing things. I remember rubbing my eyes just to make sure it wasn't in my head. I asked my cousins if they saw it too, and when I pointed it out, they confirmed it was there. It was bright and bobbed back and forth changing from a yellowish color to a transparent green hue. We followed it, and I can't remember how long we did, but we reached a small cabin, and the orb disappeared. It was dusk at this point, and curiosity got the best of me. My cousins and the neighbor kid were too scared to go up to it, but I peeked inside the window. I saw a dim light inside through a window, and what I thought was a human skull sitting on a table next to some jars, and a shadow from within moved across the far wall. I got chills and signaled for the other kids to run back the way we came, and I took off immediately behind them. We ran as fast as we could and didn't stop until we were inside the house. I locked the door behind us. I remember getting into trouble because our parents couldn't see us from the kitchen window. I didn't tell my mom or anyone else what I saw because I didn't want to scare my cousins or worry our parents. To be frank, I'm not sure if even what I think I saw was there. Later that night, I woke up to the sound of helicopters and dogs barking outside. It was well past midnight and I asked my mom who was standing in the kitchen with the rest of the adults that stayed over after a party that was going on. They all had their eyes glued to whatever was happening in the backyard through the kitchen window. 
She said they found the body of a woman in the forest, in a cabin where her killer was staying, and there was a manhunt going on. I remember not being able to sleep for the rest of the night, and the glaring white lights that shine through the folds of the blinds from the helicopters above. I'm still not sure what that orb was. Maybe it was the spirit of the woman who was trying to lead someone to her killer. I'm not even sure if one of the other kids told anyone about the cabin and what we saw. Maybe one of their parents called the police. I just remember us not being allowed to go anywhere near that tree line anymore whenever we visited after that night. I never wanted to anyway. So for a bit of background, I am from Spain with family from Italy. This story is 100% true. My dad, my brother and I are all familiar with camping and nature and all that stuff. We don't get scared easily and we aren't really superstitious or whatever. This happened in 2010 I believe. I was 8 years old then and we were on summer vacation in Italy in the region of Tuscany where some of our family is from. We were hiking in the country, far away from any towns or any other form of big civilization. We were not very familiar with this route though. All of a sudden, we stumble across what looks like an abandoned Tuscan farmhouse. Not very big though. We all look around and yell, asking whether there was someone. It looked very abandoned. The door was missing, plants growing all over the place. Safe to say, no one lived there. So, since we love adventure, and it didn't seem like a bad plan to do with two children, we decide to take a look at the place. As we're going to enter the house, out of nowhere comes a barn owl flying out of the house. So we had a quick scare, but nothing too bad. It's just an owl, right? We enter the house, and we just find the typical stuff you would imagine to find when you're in an abandoned house. Cutlery and plates on the ground. A candle, some old paintings, nothing really valuable though. We see an old wooden ladder that leads up to a hole in the ceiling. It was not a very big hole. My father couldn't fit, and so since I was the oldest of the two kids, I would go up and tell them what I saw upstairs. I went up the ladder and was in a room where I could barely see because the windows were covered with wooden boards. I could make out some things by a few sun rays that would get in through the gaps. I could see graffiti signs, and I saw another room, so I told my father and brother that I would advance and see what was up. As I opened the rotten wooden door, I immediately stood still. A disgusting, rotten smell penetrated my nose. I almost had to throw up. I wanted to know what caused this bad smell. Then, in the corner of the room, I could make out a silhouette. I got closer to investigate what it could be, and I could barely make out that it was the lifeless body of a dog. A big dog. And, spicy detail, the body was skinned. No fur, nothing. Just pure, rotting flesh in the shape of a big dog. I don't remember how long I just stood there, frozen, but I woke up from my shock with the screams of my brother because apparently the barn owl had gotten back inside the house and it almost hit him. So my dad yelled at me to come back and I gladly obeyed. When I got back downstairs, I told him what I had seen and the look he gave me was that of a man who is scared shitless but doesn't want to admit it in order to not scare his young kids. He just got close to my ear and whispered to run. We ran out of that place and never got back or even close to the route leading to it. I was hiking in the Catskills. I live in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, but I come up to the Catskills fairly regularly throughout the year because sometimes the Poconos just get a little boring. 
I started at the trailhead parking lot where I parked my car and began walking up the same trail that I've walked up a thousand times. About an hour later, I started to feel kind of weird. It felt like the woods were a little bit quieter than they usually were when I'd come up here before, but I wasn't initially very concerned about it. After I sat down to have breakfast, I started hearing rustling above me, and some sticks fell right down behind me. I wasn't really worried about this either, as I just assumed it was some squirrels running around or some chipmunks throwing things at me. This has happened to me before. I finished my breakfast without incident and kept walking towards the summit. This was fairly early in the morning, so I would think there would be a lot of birds chirping and a lot of other activity, but things just kept getting quieter and quieter as I ascended. This definitely creeped me out, but I tried to push it out of my mind because I've already been hiking for a while at this point, and I'm definitely not turning around. Eventually, more sticks fell to my right, somewhat close to me, and they sounded heavier. These were not the kind of small twigs that would generally fall from squirrel activity. I went over and checked them, and these were fairly substantial. This continued to happen in a higher frequency until I finally reached the end of the trail. On my way back, it happened continuously increasing in frequency as I descended, until suddenly it just kind of stopped when I was about a mile from the car. When I finally returned to my car, I found all of the doors open, and it seemed like a lot of my stuff had been violently rummaged through. I had a bag in there with some of my clothes in it, and this had been torn up. A lot of my clothes were outside of the car, leading back into the woods. I thought about calling the police, but I live in Philadelphia, so I knew there wasn't really anything that was going to happen. To this day, I still get freaked out when I think about it. I don't necessarily think it was connected, but I do feel really uneasy about both of these things happening at the same time. Then again, maybe I was just robbed. This story happened recently, and for some context, me and my friends are teens that like to explore and do stupid stuff, like normal teenagers do. We found this tunnel that was a drain under a busy road. We had to crouch and sit on our skateboards to explore it, since the height of the tunnel was short. As we were going deeper into the tunnel, it gets pitch black, and the flashlights from our phones can only reach about five feet in front of us so we were blind to what we could come across until we were very close to it. In the tunnel, I remember the wall was painted in all red and had sheets of metal with white handprints connected to clothespins. We decided to keep going until we reached what we thought was a dead end. It was not. On the left was a more square tunnel compared to the rectangle shape we were in. In the distance of the connected tunnel, there was a bright light coming from the outside, shining from above onto a red shopping cart with belongings in it. We slowly inched towards the light where the shopping cart was. The light turned out to be a big hole in the ground that we could crawl out of if we needed an escape. As we were about to pass the shopping cart, my friend who was in the lead was too afraid to go forward anymore. It was pitch black five feet from where we were. I decided to take the lead and keep going. I stepped past the shopping cart and stopped. I don't know what it was, but I was afraid. I had a gut feeling something was back there. I slowly moved back. I stopped. I swear I saw something move from the deep dark of the tunnel. Before I could put everything together, a loud echo of someone pounding an object on the walls of the tunnel struck me back, causing everybody to freak out and crawl out of the escape hole. Once we got out, a homeless man ran to us asking what we were doing in there. We told him we were just exploring. He explained to us that there's a man that lives underground in that tunnel, and he would have killed us if we went further. The man was apparently crazy and threw a rock at the poor guy's head before. 
Luckily, nobody was hurt, but even though it was scary and dangerous, it was fun, and I'm glad I experienced it. Now, this is something I really want to talk about, to be sure that everyone is cautious and stays level-headed at all times. Now, for context, I lived in the middle of nowhere in Canada. It was an old town that had quite a few abandoned buildings due to absence of residents. Me and many friends were tired of the lack of entertainment options for us, so what we did was explore these abandoned buildings. Prior to the experience I'm about to talk about, we never had anything too crazy happen to us. Occasionally, we'd see a small bit of blood-like liquid, and we did see a pentagram on the ground from someone who went to a house previously, but nothing too bad. Until the last time I'd gone exploring abandoned buildings. Now, when I was younger, I used to go to a daycare that was part mental hospital. Weird combination, I know. It closed down due to lack of patients and lack of children at the daycare. I decided to go back there with my friends a few years ago. For context, I was 15 when this happened. Most of my friends were the same age. When we did get there, it was rather cliche. There was fog, it was rather dark, and there was a light drizzle of rain. We went to the main gate, which was padlocked shut. We decided to help each other hop over it and made a ton of noise. We were laughing and giggling the whole time unsuspecting of what was to come. We looked around the small play place slash park with flashlights we had on our persons. Even with our somewhat powerful flashlights, our visibility was rather limited. We decided to enter the decaying building. Glass and dirt crunched under our feet as we stepped into the daycare section of the complex. There were still old Legos, wood chips from previous furniture, old torn dolls and toys strewn about. The further we walked around the daycare section, we naturally became more and more silent, until all we could hear was the crunch of the dirt under our feet. I found some crayons in a plastic container in the corner of the room. I walked over to pick them up, when all of a sudden we heard a loud crash coming from behind a metal door, leading to the psych ward part of the building. My friends and I all looked at each other. As a whole, we were a group of five. Most of them were very bold and cocky. We all looked at each other when my friend Brian suggested we go and look to see where the sound came from. Personally, I was not fond of the idea, but with my group of friends, there was no way anyone was going to decline such a thing. We all stacked up on the door and opened it. It was rusted to the floor, and we heaved to get it open. As we walked in, the metallic smells and must became stronger, with a hint of something else which I couldn't put my finger on at that moment. We walked in, our flashlights pointed in every direction with Brian leading the group. The hallways were tight, and to the left and right were the occasional metal doorway, some with doors open. I felt slightly claustrophobic, and it felt a little hard to breathe. As we continued, Brian shone his flashlight into a room and recoiled. We all stopped walking as Brian slowly entered the room. What is it? I asked him. I thought I saw someone here. It seems all fine now. To be honest, I thought he was just messing with us to increase our anxiety, but looking back, I think he was completely honest. He backed out of the room and we continued walking deeper into the psych ward when another friend swiftly told us to stop. We came to a halt and all listened. In the distance ahead of us, we heard the subtle pitter-patter of footsteps echo through the hallway. We all looked at each other, fear in each of our eyes. Brian continued walking towards the sounds. We considered turning back for a second without Brian, wondering if some ghost or something was in the building, but we couldn't do that to him. The closer we got, the more I felt like I was being watched. When finally we entered a room on the right, which had the smell of rotting meat, in front of us was a dead deer. 
Its innards were spilled all over the floor, staining the concrete. A friend of mine had a very weak stomach and vomited all over the floor. That's when we heard whispering from somewhere. Brian shone his flashlight to the corner of the room, where a man with short hair was standing with his head down. He wore a bright green t-shirt stained with what I assume was blood and torn beige pants. He did not have any socks on and his feet seemed damaged. He was twitching sporadically and continued to mumble even after we saw him. We stared at him for a solid 30 seconds before he made his first true movement. He looked up at us with a haunting grin that sent shivers down our spine. You guys here for the feast, he said. Each word with varying inflection and energy. This kicked us over the edge and we bolted out of that room, all the way back to the daycare center. The door was still open and we decided to try and slam it shut, but the rust and pure weight of the door almost kept it open. It took three of us pulling with all of our strength to close it. And just before we did, I could see the silhouette of the man watching us, his white teeth being the only other human feature I could see. As we sat behind the metal door, catching our breath for a second, all looking at each other for confirmation that we all saw the same thing. After a little bit of labored breathing from each of us, we heard a light tapping on the door. That's when we decided that it was time to leave. We booked it out of the vicinity completely and ran home. A year after we visited that spot, police went to do a routine search of the area and found the man. It was stated that this guy used to go to the psych ward before it closed down. He escaped the facility he was transferred to and lived off of the wildlife around the complex. When the cops brought him in, he had a series of diseases and sicknesses from eating raw meat. His mental condition was much worse than before. There were rumors that he did kill someone in the forest while searching for food, but nothing has been confirmed. In the end, guys, be careful, especially in dangerous areas such as abandoned buildings. And creepy guy, let's not meet. This took place last year at the beginning of summer. I was with my mom headed down to my Nana's farm to visit for a weekend. For some context, she lives on a farm way back in the country right at the foot of a mountain in rural South Carolina. It's a very rural, secluded area, so the roads are badly maintained and barely wide enough for two cars to pass one another. The houses are also spread out and set far back into the tree line from the road so there's very little ambient light besides the headlights of a car. So my mom and I are driving along, her in the driver's seat and me in the passenger's. It was around 11pm and we're 15 minutes out from Nana's, deep in the woods with the radio down almost to silent. We come onto this straight stretch of the road in a heavily wooded area, and suddenly this blur of a creature darts out across the road, right at the edge of our headlights. It was moving pretty good, but both me and my mom were able to get a good look at it and both agreed on what we saw. It was a fairly large creature, roughly the size of a person or maybe larger. Neither of us could make out the head, but we both remember it appearing to have a segmented body, as if it were emaciated and its ribcage was poking out. The reflection of light made it hard for me to tell color, but my mom said she remembered it to be dark and she didn't see fur or hair. It had long limbs, and as it moved across the road, it didn't run the way a dog or horse would, with all four legs. The best word to describe it would be lopping, using its front limbs to pull itself along, and it was moving considerably fast. We both said something along the lines of, What the hell is that? as it crossed in front of us. As we got up to where it had crossed, I turned to look at it just as it reached the other side of the road and out of our headlights, and I swear on my life, it stood up and ran. 
not like a dog rearing on its hind legs. It was definitely bipedal. I immediately yelled that it had stood up, and we both started getting nervous. I honestly would have thought I was going insane had I not had another person in the car with me. My mom has always been a pretty level-headed person and not superstitious, but she was very nervous and made me agree to not tell my nana about it to avoid scaring her, which made me recognize how serious this was. I should also mention that there had apparently been a series of attacks on livestock and horses in the area around the time this happened. People were saying they found wire fences ripped through and their animals attacked. There have been a few other strange instances in the area, but that was my personal experience. I wanted to share an experience I had back in the spring of 2018. I have had a few of what could be considered paranormal experiences in my life, but this was the most recent and unnerving. I am an avid outdoorsman and love to hunt and camp around the Francis Marion and Sumter National Forest. Back in 2018, I took my young son and dog out to a remote area in the National Forest to test out a new camper shell on my recently purchased truck. We found a secluded area off a dirt road, made dinner, and then packed it in for the night as soon as it got dark. Around 11pm at night, I sat up and looked out the back of the truck due to my dog growling. In the distance, I saw what looked like hundreds of small white balls of light darting around, then hovering for a few seconds and slowly converging on our campsite. They looked just like the dust orbs you see on videos but these were producing light in a completely dark forest. They soon surrounded my truck. It seemed like there were hundreds of them. They were a soft white light, and they didn't blink. After 30 minutes of them floating around and concentrating around us, I finally worked up the nerve to open the truck and lit a lantern, and they promptly disappeared. After turning off the lights and locking back up, they came back. My son was fast asleep, thank goodness. I watched them until I finally fell asleep at around 1am. The next morning, when we tried to leave, the battery was dead on the new truck. There weren't any lights in the back cab where we would have used any power. A week later, I had to replace the electric control module, but I'm not sure if it's connected. Has anyone had a similar experience? Just thinking about them again makes the hair stand up on my neck. About five years ago, I was taking a solo motorcycle trip from Utah to Wisconsin and back, two days riding there, two days back, with about a week between. When I left on the very first day, my plan was to get somewhere in Nebraska, grab a hotel room, and continue on the next day. I didn't make any hotel reservations or anything, more of a, I'll figure it out when I'm tired kind of deal. First mistake right there. By the time I was actually tired, every highway adjacent hotel I could find was booked full. I guess this was because Sturgis had just ended and people were heading home. This is what one of the desk managers at one hotel claimed so who knows. To give you an idea, I was just barely over the Wyoming-Nebraska border when I got tired. I had waited out a storm in Wyoming for a few hours. Going on about 1.30am, I'm still riding through Nebraska, just taking every exit with a hotel to find an open one, and stopping at a bunch of gas stations to stay awake. It was really only me and semi-trucks on the road. I leave a fairly large truck stop at the same time as some car that I wasn't really paying attention to. We both got on the highway, the car behind me. I get up to cruising speed, right around 7 over the speed limit, and this car just stays behind me. Cut to about 20 miles later, this car is still behind me, but uncomfortably close. Had I needed to hit the brakes for anything major, 
deer running across the road, for example, he'd hit me for sure. So I let off the gas, figuring he'll just go around me and go on his way. No dice. I slowed all the way down to about 60 miles per hour, and he just held it there for a while. He stayed right behind me. At this point, I wasn't really sure what to do about it, so I just sped back up to highway speed and kept going. It was at this time I figured he might just be a cop. Being as nervous as I was, I really wanted to find out. I decided I could afford a speeding ticket, so I got up to about 12 to 15 over the limit for a few miles. Still nothing. Just a car staying right behind me. Maybe 50 feet back on a more or less deserted highway. We were still passing the occasional truck. Some time later, I'm down to about a half a tank, and at almost 3 a.m., I decide that at the next gas station, I'll take a long break. I see a sign for gas and take the exit. Guys, this gas station, no joke, has two pumps and one overhead light. It's like straight out of a horror movie. The car followed me to the gas station. I noped out of there back to the highway. Less than a quarter of a mile. That car followed me the whole time, into the parking lot, and then right back out. The next gas station wasn't too far away, maybe 10 to 15 miles, a big truck stop type of deal. The car follows me off the exit and goes around to the other side of the main building somewhere. I stop there anyway, go into the small diner, and sit in a spot on the other side of the window as my bike. I grab a bit of food. I call ahead to the next few hotels available, and luckily one had a room. I reserved it, went back out to the bike, and went on toward the highway. No car in sight. I got to the hotel around 4am with no other problems, and finally got some sleep. I still have absolutely no idea who was in the car, or what they were doing, but it sure had freaked me out. This just happened. So my boyfriend and I are currently hiking the Pacific Crest Trail in California. It's extremely common to get hitches along the trail, and most people who live in towns bordering the trail are fairly kind, self-seeming folk. Emphasis on seeming. Well, today, we found ourselves a bit lost after trying to take a less traveled alternative trail. After lots of struggling and practically bushwhacking, we made our way down the hill and ended up accidentally on someone's property. This property is big. It's a large ranch with a few different buildings. We tried to skedaddle as fast as possible off the property, but one of the ranch dogs saw us and the owner came up in a golf cart. I explained that we accidentally got lost hiking and apologized, and he said it happens often and he was really understanding. He asked if we wanted a ride into town since he was about to leave anyway. Given how common hitchhiking is on trail and how nice he was, we accepted and he drove us to town. On the ride there, he told us he used to be in the DEA and had participated in more shootouts than people fighting in the army. Weird, but okay. I didn't think much of it. I noticed my boyfriend was really quiet though and I thought it was odd. As soon as we hop out of the car, my boyfriend grabs our backpacks and tells me to check my phone. He had sent me an article about the guy we just got a ride from and how this guy was involved in his girlfriend's disappearance and a suspicious death on the ranch property not too long after. Apparently, his girlfriend went missing after signing property transfers of her ranch over to him. She was never found and the suspicious death on the ranch was a worker who got killed by an ATV. But toxicology showed a meth overdose. Given his DEA background, I found that part specifically suspicious. Also, he's on the sex offender registry for groping two women on a snowmobile tour. My boyfriend and I are 100% okay, but we're just shaken up that we got a hitch from a possible murderer. 
Be careful who you get hitches from, even if they're friendly. I came here hoping anyone could share similar experiences or give insight. I took a trip to stay in a cabin in the middle of the woods, high up in the mountains of the city of Ranger, Georgia, USA. This neighborhood was 30 minutes up in the mountains, away from civilization, and even the cabins were spread far apart. The front deck of the cabin was completely exposed to the woods, so I acknowledged that any animals could stroll along if they pleased, but I stayed there for about a week, and me and my boyfriend sat outside on the front deck every night, very late, and at no point felt in danger. It was peaceful with fireflies out and sounds of crickets every night. Until the fifth night. It was eerily dark too. The moon was covered heavily. It was about midnight and all of a sudden I didn't feel peace like I did those other nights. The forest went completely quiet and I felt a horrible sense of dread. I genuinely feared for my life. I sat there in my chair, looking out into the dark forest, trying to rationalize and calm myself down that it was my mind playing tricks. But all of a sudden, my boyfriend said out loud that he felt unsafe. I told him I felt the same and we ran inside. The cabin has three floors and we were able to climb out the window and sit on the roof because we still wanted to be outside and relax. It didn't matter how high up I was, I felt something truly evil and stayed inside. The only other time I felt something so evil or like someone was watching was when I had a few paranormal experiences at a haunted house. Georgia doesn't really get mountain lions, maybe a bear, but it didn't feel that way at all. This happened years ago when I was around the age of 19 or 20 and worked retail part-time at the mall. I was the closing shift that night and left around 10.30pm to head home. I often took the inside streets versus the freeway, which included a small stretch of back road that was usually pretty empty, especially during that time of night. This particular night, I noticed a car about 10 minutes into my 30-minute drive going the same way as me, but I didn't think much of it. As we're approaching the stretch of back road that's usually deserted at that time, the driver behind me starts flashing their high beams and slowing down and speeding up while tailgating me. I remember feeling panic that they might hit my car. Eventually the car pulls up beside me, and I can now see a middle-aged man who's pointing towards the back of my car and then motioning for me to roll down my window. I roll my window down about halfway, and he says something about how my tire looks like it's flattening, and I'm going to damage the rim if I don't pull over soon. I tell him I don't know how to change a tire, but I'm not too far from home so I should be fine. But he's pretty insistent about how it will only take a few minutes, and he's happy to help. I know something is off, because my car seems to be driving fine. I politely say I'm fine, but thanks anyway and I roll my window up. He drives next to me for what feels like forever, but it couldn't have been more than a minute or two. At this point, something feels so off that I'm afraid to even physically look in his direction. I focus on the road the best I can, and eventually he slows down and moves behind me again. After a few minutes, we reach a more populated, well-lit part of town, and I see him make a U-turn. I get home and take a look, and my tire is perfectly fine. I have no idea if he followed me from the mall or what that man's intentions were, but I think it's safe to say they weren't anything good. I even had my dad check all my tires the next morning, and the tire pressure on them was in the normal range. I still think of this night from time to time, and it makes me nauseous to think about how differently things might be today. 
if I had decided to pull over that night. I was working night shift in a gas station slash truck stop in Tucumcari, New Mexico back in the mid-90s. I had another guy working with me who ran the diesel side while I worked the gas side. We had a guy come in around 1 or 2 a.m. and just looked at stuff in the aisles for a while before he left. I didn't really think twice about him. Later, at about 6 a.m., when I got off, I drove home past a convenience store named Alsuf's. They're big in the southwest. There had to have been 30 cop cars in the parking lot. There aren't even 30 cop cars in Tucumcari, so where they came from I have no idea. I come to find out that sometime during the night, the Allsups had been robbed and the clerk had been taken into the cooler, tied up, and beheaded. I found that out when I was awoken by the state police a few hours later and asked if I'd seen anything suspicious during the night. That guy who came in and left was the only thing I could think of. The police took a copy of our security footage, which led them to a suspect who was later convicted for the murder. I can't even begin to tell you how hard it was to go to work the next day. We kind of assumed that the guy was going to rob us first, but didn't want to deal with two clerks. So he left and hid all subs instead. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed that. If you have a scary story of your own to share and you would like me to feature it on the channel, please send it to the email in the description. Or if you prefer, head over to my subreddit, r slash stories from Mr. Revenant. It's the stories that keep the channel going. Thank you all for listening. And thank you to my channel members and patrons. Laney, Tripping Balls Through History, Samantha, Erica, Alyssa, Tracy, Killian's Place, April, James Arterburn, Jen, Joy, Handout, Pegasus Genesis, Karen Keating, V. Berry, LJ, Fiona X. Fox, Scott, I Like Booty, Monica Level Ace, Chris and Donna, Holly Spry, Kimber, Jasmine, Sanatix, Heather Haven, Kitty Cat Luna 2, ADHD Aurora, Janice, Cinderella Baby, Borderline Betty, Lady Dracard, Erica Nicole, Snowball Rathena, Melanie, The Honeybee 987, Pretty Girl 215, Ryan, Brooke, Wendy, Crafty Kel, Tina, Dina, Vampy Debs, Patricia, Amber, Krista, Brenda, Absinthe Alice, Christy, Kay, Spider's Web, Ooh La La Andrea, Sue, Monique, Sean Gorman, Emma Lisa, Sigma Cube X, Greg, Chelsea, Amanda Jane, Sam, Zeb Tepe, Sarah C, Austin, Tegan, Lil Smart, Jenny, Gabrielle, Fire 05, Sarah P, James Gargano, Gemma Allen, Monica Level Ace, and Alex. I hope you're all doing well, guys. I'll see you all on the next one.